Welcome everybody to Greywater Action's 2016 webinar series. My name is Laura Allen. Uh, before we get started with today's topic, I have a couple of housekeeping items. If you want to ask any questions just throughout the presentation or send your comments, please use the chat dialog box on your left. And we'll be pausing a couple times during the presentation to answer questions, and there'll also be time at the end for more questions. If you want to see a larger image of the slides, just put your mouse, your cursor over to the top right corner of the slide, and you can enlarge the view. Today's topic is how to incorporate gray water into your landscaping business. I'm really happy to introduce Alan Hackler from Bay Maples, to who's going to be giving today's presentation. Thank you so much, Alan, for joining us. Thank you. All right, so I appreciate everyone for attending. Um, my name is Alan Hackler, and so I started Bay Maples in 2008. Um, shortly after leaving San Jose State, I got my degree in environmental studies. Um, my first introduction to gray water was um, living in my house while I was going to college. I just disconnected my kitchen sink and would bucket kitchen water out of my back door and fill up a bucket out of uh, my shower while the water was heating up. And I remember seeing that they were changing the the uh, code restrictions for the, the plumbing code in in uh, 2009 and then saw that saw gray water action and took Laura's five day installation course in I think February of 2010. And then ever since then have been incorporating gray water into my business model. And currently I have about uh, 10 employees and we're located down in San Jose and we specialize in rain catchment and gray water systems. All right, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, so my, my gray water process, um, typically um, the way we do it is um, a client will, and I'll kind of go into the marketing and advertising of, of the, my business later on, but a client will call us um, through seeing our website or different um, outlets and schedule a meeting. Typically before I go to a site visit to meet a client, um, I schedule a, a phone interview just to get an idea of what type of system they want, what is their site conditions, how much water they use, um, basically just as much water, as much information as possibly can. I try to have them send me some pictures. I could be looking at some pictures while I'm talking to on the phone. And I really, I kind of use that to sort of set their expectations uh, what the system will look like, some basic costs, um, kind of what it will look like. And I think that is a really good introduction. Um, sometimes it just allows me to get an idea of uh, the scope of the project and um, and just kind of improves the, the initial site visit. Um, yeah, and so we'll get into some more details of that. So I, I really wanted to, um, I guess, start out with just showing you like a few systems that we've done. I feel like I, I was nervous my, my presentation would have too many too many slides with just words, so I, I figured I'd show something fun, just go and do one of our projects and show you kind of a few examples of what we've done. Um, Laura wanted me to show some different success stories of different products we've worked on. So this is a picture. Um, this is one of my one of my favorite clients and projects that we worked on. We did this uh, about a year ago, um, and so the reason why I like this system is it. It incorporates a, a whole house pump system and also a laundry to landscape system and also a rain catchment system. So we use, there's no traditional irrigation used all on the property and they use they use no municipal water for the garden. So this was a really fun a fun project to design and install. Um, so what we're looking at here is a, is a is a small gray flow brand system with a, a a pump and a filter and a small surge tank which is getting water from the bathroom shower and bathroom sink and to, to access the plumbing you can see where we kind of cut out the concrete to put the pump and then we ran the line here's the, the plumbing under the house and we ran the line to the front yard here's a little close-up of sort of the schematic of what the plumbing looked like and then here is the this is the front yard area where we're installing the gray water uh, irrigation line we incorporated a, a rain tank um, as well, here's the tank in the front. We found a nice little spot to hide it behind a tree here. Blends in very well. And here's what the drip line looked like. And then we also installed a launch to landscape system. We also cut the concrete here to get through. And here's the full front yard. 
here's an after project. And one one of the reasons why I really I, I like I like this project is a lot of times with gray water when a client is asking me, you know, if if gray water is feasible or will they still need to use additional um, um, water source to, to feed the rest of the of the, of the, um, the garden. And I really like to demonstrate using various tactics to to minimize uh, water use on the garden. So using not just gray water but rain catchment, incorporating multiple types of gray water sources, incorporating mulching, um, appropriate plants, and a, a combination of those things. So when you can find creative ways of demonstrating that to the client, it, I think it helps to kind of sell that concept and, and sell the idea to the client and make the project more feasible. And I also think doing some of these gray water changes is good to do during an, a whole uh, landscape remodel. So if you're already going to be tearing up the lawn anyways or and tearing up the landscape and, and putting in pathways and various features, it's a great time to, to make those modifications. This is one of my favorite projects. So another project that worked out really well for us, um, this was a, a garden, a, a pretty large lot. It was about an 8,000 8, square foot garden, and they were finding, wanted, finding, wanted to find ways to reduce their water bill. And this is a, a rewater system that also has a surge tank and a pump and a filtration system. This is a sand filter. So before we did the installation, we ripped out the existing lawn with a sod cutter. And you can see on the right, the guys are digging out the hole for the surge tank. Here's a little close-up of it. And this is a schematic of where the tank is after the hole was built with a uh, small redwood wall around it to protect the tank. Top right, you can see the sand filter. The purple line kind of shows where we, where we bored the hole into the foundation. So you can see the gray water line coming from all of the pictures in the house. We have three bathroom sinks, three showers, and a laundry machine all feeding this tank. And you can see where the overflow is of the green line and the blue water gets pumped up to the right, pumped up into the sand filter. In the next picture, you can see where the fresh water, when there's not enough water being, gray water being produced, the fresh water kicks on from the municipal water supply. And that makes up for the, the to fill the demand for the irrigation. But there's not enough from, from gray water. And the kind of fuchsia colored shows the back flush line. And the back flush flows into a French drain that we installed. And this is a little close up of the, the plumbing again. Showing where the irrigation lines go. Here's the buried with soil and the final picture. This system was definitely a bit of a challenge with getting the permits and arranging the plumber and getting access to the house. The client wanted us to be there to get inside the house to do the work to access. So there is definitely a lot of logistical issues with this. We'll talk a little more about that later on. Um, this is a close-up of the irrigation emitters of that system. They have these little cones by the emitters to help limit roots growing into the emitters and getting clogged, getting little holes for the emitters. Partially covered before. I was really the, the client insisted on putting grass back in. I was I tried so hard to get them to not put in grass, but we removed grass, put in more grass again, and then water with gray water. I, I it was a difficult battle. I got them to install, if you can see in the back, some fruit trees and some native plants, so it wasn't all lawn, but they were really insistent on watering lawn. This is a lawn. It was at least buffalo grass, so it was a, at least a drought tolerant lawn that didn't require too much water. So we got a, a small trade-off. Here are some fruit trees and some uh, ginger, some California native irises, some woodwardia ferns, and think some hookah in the back as well too. Um, okay, so now I showed you a few of our projects. I kind of want to get into sort of the, the advertising side of things. So I, I don't do – what's worked for me is to really not do much traditional advertising. Um, things that have worked for me are um, doing garden shows. The, the picture on the right shows us at the San Francisco Flower and Garden Show a couple of years ago doing a booth, we installed uh, an aquaponic system with a, a, a small gray water display, and you, we 
use a lot of reused materials. So this is a good way to show people kind of our, our approach and technique to doing ecological gardening design. Um, I think these, these, why I like doing these booths is you have a chance to really talk to a lot of people in, in a short amount of time. And you're usually talking to people who are either in the process of a gardening project or thinking about a gardening project or are people who do a lot of DIY gardening projects. And I think it works great too because people can actually put a, put a face behind the company and they're not just calling you based on a flyer or an ad or, you know, driving by a job site to actually get to meet you and talk to you. And I, I think those are, those are much better end up being much better clients that way. Um, and lots of times some events we've gone to are, we've done like birthday events, which can be free. Um, different events that even at high schools have asked us to come out and do different educational events. And sometimes those can be free and there can be free advertising. So nice parents like to support people who have supported their school. Um, so I think that those are really great ways to, to um, get the word out. Um, and using another thing that's worked really well is, is rebate programs. So we, have gotten a lot of work from the lawn removal program through the Santa Clara Valley Water District. So we're one of the registered contractors, and that has been a, a really great source of advertising for us and getting our name out there. I'm um, also using professional groups like the um, CLCA, um, CNPS, those are California uh, Landscape Contractors Association, the California Native Plant Society, um, Graywater Action. Um, so different various professional groups are, are a really good way to connect with other professionals, especially other designers. We get a lot of projects through designers who design a gray water or rain catchment system into their project. And then they usually struggle to find contractors who have the knowledge to install gray water and rain catchment systems. And so having connections with those designers when they do design those features into a project, it's good to kind of be on their um, sort of their call list because that they'll usually want to refer you for those designs. So it's really good to set up those relationships. Um, so marketing, I think it's really important to, um, I think in general, I like to make gardening fun. So I think it, the more you can make garden fun, simple and feasible and engaging is going to really get people excited about doing it. Um, so one thing too, a lot of people are always really nervous, especially like I, I do a lot of talks. And one of the questions I always get from people, from attendees is the permitting issue. And, and the permitting, I've had really great success with permits in the past. I've had a couple times where, you know, it took a few more visits. But I feel like if you are if you can be flexible with the city or, or the enforcing agency, they usually want to work with you. Um, and I try to make it seem as easy as possible, and I try and take it off the client's plate. I, if the client thinks it's going to be a pain and hassle and time-consuming and costly for them, they're not going to do it. So I try to really just make it seem easy. You know, like, oh, are we going to need a permit? I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I can help you take care of it. Um, you know, there'll be a small fee. We can add that into the contract. And, and even though you, you're kind of biting your tongue because you know it might be difficult, try to make it seem easier for the client because I think that's going to really break down some of the barriers for a lot of people. I think the more that people get permits, I think the city will more likely to make the permitting process easier. So I think it's, it, it's, really, goes, it's really important to, to kind of minimize the, the fear factor in clients of getting permits. Um, another thing in marketing is make it, make your systems look beautiful whenever possible. Um, and you know, there's a lot of different ways of doing that. I won't go into too much detail, but I think just making it look appealing. Um, participating in tours, um, I think are a great way, just like doing um, the garden shows, doing tours, you get a lot of people seeing it at a short amount of time. You get to talk to your clients. They get to see in person. They can touch it. They can see the plants. They can see the pipes. They can, you can turn the system on. They can see the water flow. I think it's a great way to have people do hands-on, like get hands-on experience and knowledge. Um, having an open house, so if you're a contractor, um, and even if you have a, a system that you install at your house or a client's house or at some other site, maybe offering an open house tour of the site and maybe a small workshop to go along with it, I think it's a great way to um, engage people. Um, so some more. So I'm kind of old school in marketing. I'm I'm more this uh, Sanford and Son style. So <laughs> another way we get our marketing out there is have our logo on the truck. We kind of let people know what we do. Um, and just I think people just <laughs> kind of getting out there and, you know, seeing us on the job site can be really, you know, having a good branding, having a good logo that's recognizable um, is, is key. Um, um, also what we do is 
for marketing. So we try and do something, you know, like I said, making it look beautiful and artistic um, instead of kind of doing kind of one of those funky or not, uh, not funky, but a, one of those kind of cheesy plastic signs. We have a little heart hand carved wooden sign and it kind of, it kind of makes us stand out a little bit more and it gets, it just is a, a different way to engage people and kind of catch their eye. And I feel like since gray water is different, I feel like I want to show that we're different and we have our own different, more kind of thoughtful approach. And I think even coming up with creative signage is kind of fits in with that. And it's a great way to catch people's eye. Um, so like I said, offering workshops is a great way. Um, and we, we even, I, my friend made this flyer, um, so even making the flyer kind of fun and engaging, you know, even making it just kind of using a lot of color and some kind of fun animation, you know, it's also, it's, I feel bad because it's, it's not 100% correct because it kind of shows the pump and using in the hose, which isn't really up to code. My friend did such a good job doing this, I, I, I couldn't bear telling him that it wasn't quite correct. But anyways, I think it's kind of fun, just a fun way to advertise it and cast people's eye. Um, this was a free workshop. I host this actually at my house. Um, so people could kind of see it in person. Um, and get, and and I think it really it, it I think it says a lot when people get to see that you're doing it at your own house. Um, I think it really adds kind of value and credence to these kind of systems if they see that you're doing it. You're not just kind of using it as a gimmick or a sales pitch. Um, and so here is the workshop that I had at my house. Um, you know, I, I have a on the left. I have this little mobile workshop or kind of mobile display that I use for different classes. I bring that to schools. I brought it to different libraries for talks and different events. Um, it's a great way for people to see what a simple valve looks like. Um, it put some simple signage so people can see it, and it, it's really easy to move. You can throw it in your car really easy. Um, my friend added some color to it to kind of make it a little more engaging. Um, but that's a nice little selling. So I've even brought this to clients' houses for the initial meeting. They can see it. Um, it works really well. Um, yeah. And so here's a picture of the flyer, some other flyers that we've done. So once again, we have like a, this is an open house we had at our office, another one we had for a rank attachment workshop. Um, making the, fl the, the flyers fun and engaging, um, making it kind of also educational, giving it, you know, a little tidbit of information about what, what, their, what their workshop is about. Um, and I, I kind of I think this kind of falls into the category of sort of educating your clients and educating your clientele. Um, then a lot of, a lot of times I'll go to the workshop or people come to the workshop, they'll ask all the questions they might ask when they call me. So instead of having a bunch of different phone conversations with different people, they kind of come to your workshop and you're sort of having that almost that initial conversation at your workshop. They get to see it at your house. And I think it's a great way. Um, social networking and, and digital tools. Um, I feel like this can work um, – better or worse for, for different people. It really depends on, on what your level of proficiency and, and using some of these tools are. I feel like it takes a little bit of dedication. Um, I, if you really kind of have to be up on top of it if you want to keep, you know, your, your media fresh and keep people coming to your, your social media sites. I think YouTube works really well. We've had, we post some videos on our website. Um, and a lot of times I'll go to an, an initial consultation. Someone will ask me about something. And I'm like, how does he know that? And, or and how did they, you know, how, how do they have this information? And they always say, oh, I watched your video, I saw your talk, or, and so it's always funny that people will come and watch, and watch the whole video and and really learn a lot about that and get a chance to see what we do and kind of get a feel for us. And I think that's a really great way is having videos and people really seem to enjoy it. Um, so local marketing, this has worked out really well for us too. Um, this was an article they did in, in the Metro, which is just a a local paper in San Jose. Um, which goes out to different neighborhoods in, in the South Bay area. So this is a great way to kind of connect with different local um, local clients as well too, and also educate them as well. Um, and, and like like I was saying, so this is the front yard of my house. So I think I almost see my garden in my house as sort of like a giant business card. Um, I feel like people seeing me do it and and kind of showcase some of these things really kind of lay, uh, lends more credence to, to doing this. And I feel like if I stand by it in my own house and my own way of living, then it's easier to kind of sell them on it. Um, I've got a little free library in front and a little bench made from reuse material and a rain catchment system with a rain swill. And, and also lets people see some of these concepts and, and also kind of stand by some of the things that we say. And it's also fun. And this is also uh, my backyard that I use as a demonstration garden. 
um, allowing clients to, to come over and see it. And I think that's a nice way to show some of the different um, styles of systems. Um, I, from anywhere from a low-tech system with a very simple longitude landscape system, I have uh, just an outdoor shower, which is a gravity feed into some fruit trees. Um, and I also have a pumped Aqua 2 system, you can see in the bottom right. Um, and I have a pumped 2,600-gallon tank. And so this lets people see a variety of different approaches and styles. And so I, th I think it's a nice way to, to engage people and, and let them see in person. Um, and so another way I, I, I do marketing, so this was a garden that we actually installed in Juvenile Hall. Um, we put in an edible garden there. Um, and this was some great publicity for us just because people got this. And I mean, I, this was something I would do anyways besides the publicity, just to engage people and, and um, promote the idea of sustainable gardening. But it also was a great way to show people um, just another way you're kind of connecting with the community and just a way to kind of make yourself stand out from just your typical contractor or designer. Um, they had a, a ribbon cutting in the, the city. The mayor came out and um, took some pictures. And so this was a fun way to get lots of marketing, and it didn't cost me anything. I, I helped do some sheet mulching and spread some cardboard, and all it cost me was a couple hours of my time. So this is a free way to market and do something good in the community and get our name out there. So I think this is a, a really great approach to take, especially if you're just starting out with your business and there isn't a lot of, a lot of money to spend on marketing, but a lot of times as a young business, uh, when you're starting out your business, you might have a little more time to spend and maybe donate some of your labor on the weekend. So I think this is a, a creative way to, to get your name out there. Um, so the four Ps, I was talking about this presentation to my buddy who's a marketing guy, and he said I had to mention the four Ps. Um, so that the four Ps are product, price, promotion, and place. Um, and so one thing too, I, I, the, it, with the, the product, I think it's really important to realize that you're not just selling gray water. You're you're, you're really selling your, yourself and and sort of the way you conduct business. Um, I've been a contractor for about six years now, and one thing that I really have I've come to learn is it really doesn't matter about how fancy of a truck you have or how cool a logo you have or what kind of office you have or any other stuff. If they don't like dealing with you. All that stuff does not matter. Even if your systems work great, if they're just if if you're don't return phone calls, or you come late, or you don't you don't really follow up on what you say you're going to do, or it comes out a little bit different, that really will irk people, and it makes people not want to refer you. And I think referrals are the best way to get new clients. So I think it's really important to to realize you're not just selling gray water and parts; you're really selling yourself and you're selling the service because the people your clients have to like you, and I think that's really really important. Um, um, and so price, it's, I think, you know, some people see the initial price of, of, of some of the systems and they're, they, they are a little bit surprised that it costs them much. Um, or they say, oh, I can just do a regular system for, the, for less. Um, or they'll say, it's, you know, why am I going to spend so much money? They drop my go in a couple years or whatever the reason might be. So I think it's really important to show there's, there's other intrinsic values into doing this besides just saving water. Um, I think just the enjoyment of just the satisfaction you get from using gray water, not using regular water, um, the fact that you're not using, you're cutting down on infrastructure it takes to build more to more water and sewer lines. And so kind of really emphasizing some of those things, you know, um, sort of the, the, the triple bottom line of, of sustainability, which is which is economics, ecology, and um, equality. And so those are all things you can kind of really – used to demonstrate so like so, and not just pr when you say price it's more like the value of it so demonstrating different um important values in, in, in doing gray water and rain catchment or just sustainable gardening in general um and promotion so enticement so you know just telling people about different rebates um or um different um the different even free workshops or just different way of kind of engaging people and 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 um and finding um, economic incentives um, in place. So, so I think place is. I, I left it kind of open because I think that uh, place is sort of how how the gray water kind of fits into their lifestyle, into their garden, into the community. And so I think it's really important to kind of demonstrate how how gray water can can kind of can affect affect their quality of life. 
All right, let me get through the next slide. So holistic design, um, I think it's really key to, and it, it definitely comes into play even in a, an existing garden or in a garden where it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a full retrofit, finding ways to, you know, some people have the idea that gray water will, will can meet all their, their needs or, so, or sort of be like kind of a silver bullet in terms of water saving. But I think it, it takes a combination of doing gray water, rain catchment, incorporating swales and berms, in the appropriate place, using appropriate plants, mulching, composting. So finding a way to kind of bring all those concepts together is, is really, really key. And you're going to maximize the, the benefit of all those different, those different um, techniques, the more you can get them to work together. And that's very much a, a permaculture concept. And I think it's a, it's a really great way to approach the garden. And that can also be a good way to sell them on sort of the cost of doing these systems, that if you can if you can connect them with all these other features of the garden, it can it can get better value out of the system. Um, so this is a garden that we did in San Jose, where there's no there's no irrigation at all of any kind actually, and there's just a small launch to landscape system and a, a rain catchment system in the backyard, and everything else every, the front yard is basically zero scaped, so, and there's also a small swale right here in the, in, the, in the left of the picture. So this is a way of, of creating some holistic design. We also used some redwood rounds as little steps, and we used um, arbor mulch as the mulch in this project and used um, a sheet mulching to get rid of the lawn. So incorporating all those, those different techniques to, to achieve a net zero water garden. I think is a really, this is a, a good way to to get the client to understand how these features work together and also a really great selling point. Um, so this is also a garden where we get many clients who don't really want to change out their plants too much or want to use as much of the existing um, irrigation system. So in this garden, we kept the clients existing. She had some ferns and some very shade loving plants. We added a couple of fruit trees and we're able to use some of the existing one-inch PVC lines. And so that cut down on the cost a lot and also enabled her not to have to tear up their garden. That can be that can be uh, something that can maybe stop a lot of clients from, from incorporating gray water if, it, if they feel like they have to rip up their garden too much. So if you can find creative ways of not having to do that and use their existing plants, as long as the plants are appropriate, I think it's a, it's a really great way to sell the system and, and sell the idea. Um, so also, um, I think they're having different certifications are really helpful. It just is a great way to demonstrate um, the time and energy you've spent to learn some of these techniques. It's a great way to kind of benchmark your, your knowledge and your experience. Um, so Bay Friendly is a great program. Um, getting your permaculture certificate is highly recommended. RDI, which is the Regenerative Design Institute, uh, Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, and Quail Springs are all—they're all, they're all um, permaculture design institutes I recommend. They offer lots of great classes. Um, so, being a licensed contractor, um, I know a lot of contract. I know a lot of people who are in the trades who, for various reasons, feel like it's too much of a pain or too much of an investment. Um, I couldn't. I can't emphasize enough how how much I feel like it's worth the effort to to get your license. Um, it, it's really not that difficult. Um, the cost invest investment upfront will more than pay for itself if there's ever a time where you get sued or get in trouble for not having a license. So I think it definitely justifies the the cost to go through the classes and pay for the the tests and paying for the bonds. And once you are licensed, you can you can charge more as a contractor. Um, and it's it's kind of funny also, clients usually have less of a problem paying you. When clients know you're not licensed, you know you're kind of working under the table and working kind of shady, you're a lot more likely to have clients just not want to pay you because they know that you don't have any recourse in terms of getting the money. So I think in terms of protecting you and the clients, I, I think it, it, it's definitely worth it. You can also, you have recourse of someone ever tries to 
pay you when you've completed the contract fairly. You can take them to small claims court. You can use a lien. I, I've never had to do either one of those things, which is I cross my fingers. Um, but it's good to at least have a license and have that recourse if, if ever need be. Um, so the process of getting a license, um, I put the link to the California State Landscape Board. And you can go on there and you can get testing material. You can sign up for a test. Um, you can find out if someone is a licensed contractor. It's a uh, really good resource. Um, so the basics of getting your license are make sure you have four years experience. This can also be done through um, getting a, a bachelor's degree um, or going to a trade program um, in the construction field or, or being a plumber or being in the union. Um, you also need to get a $1,500 bond. Um, you need to get liability insurance. In California, they require a million dollars bond, a million dollars insurance policy. Um, I I pay my insurance is a few hundred dollars um, by ten employees. So if it's just you and maybe one other employee, you might be able to get insurance for maybe as cheap as fifty dollars a month or so, um, which is not that bad. And the, one of the other things is having your business registered. Having a business license and a fictitious name license, and having a business having a, a a bank account in your business name, those are all requirements for getting your license and taking the test. Um, there's a lot of great practice tests you can take. You can t you can do one or two or multi-day kind of crash courses, which I highly recommend. And once you if you take those courses, they also help you get it, get your bond as well too. Um, and and one of the the last things you can do is have another contractor vouch for you. So usually whoever, whatever contract you work with before to get your experience hopefully can also give you, be the contractor to, to write your referral. Um, but I can't emphasize how much I think it's worth the effort to get a license. Um, so, so contracts, I think um, contracts are, are extremely important to do any kind of um, work in the trades. Um, it's really important to to know that a contract is only required for a project over $500. Um, you can basically consider it like a handyman job if it's under $500, and that includes labor and material. A really creative way to get around that, not well, get around that rule, but to kind of maximize that rule to your benefit if you're not licensed is you can have the homeowner pay for the material directly and then you can work up to $500 in labor. So this could definitely cover like a laundry to landscape type system, and you could easily do those systems um, without being a licensed contractor and still get paid appropriately. And, and you could still write a small contract for under $500 without being licensed. Um, so I think another important part of writing a contract is to, is to sort of be forthcoming and honest as much as possible and set, up, set appropriate expectations. So letting the client know when the work will start, how long it'll take, um, sort of how many guys you're going to have on site, what the scope of work is. When I when I write when I write a bid, I I, I literally write the bid as if they were I were giving one of my employees instructions for how to do the work. I would say deliver materials, bring this material, be there at this time. There will be three crew members. We're going to do the work at this location on the northeast corner of the house. We're going to excavate two inches deep. We're going to cut a one-inch hole into the ground or a one-inch hole through the exterior wall and, 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 and literally write down almost every single step of the project. And that really, really helps in terms of, of what the client is expecting to be done because if, if if you don't include all those things, you might have a client say, oh, why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that? And if, But if it says, well, it's not spelled out in the contract, so that's that's going to be something we would do a change order for. That's not something that we agreed to. So, But if you don't write that detail, you kind of get in this gray area of what the client expects you to do and what you were thinking you were going to do. And then if they're thinking you're going to do more work, but you can't afford it because it's not in the bid, then you can get in some really tough situations and you could end up losing money on a job. So I think writing it, and, and what I do is I have a really detail, a few different detailed descriptions of a launch the landscape system, a pump system, a branch drain system, and I just use them as a template, and I just interchange information for each project. So I change the address name, the client name, maybe a few details of the scope of work, but I can just keep reusing the same information. I have to retype it every time. I think it's a really great way to do it.
Um, try to be consistent and follow through whenever possible. Um, you have to have two copies of any contracts. When I go to when I go meet a client, I always have two versions. We both sign each version. They keep one, I keep one. So I both we both know that we have the same original copy. Um, I never start any project without a deposit. And also in my contract, I always list a schedule of payments and list what the amount will be at each progress payment. So I'll say the if the if the project is let's just say five thousand dollars. I'll ask for $1,000 up front, maybe $2,000. I, I usually ask for a progress payment after a demo. It's a really easy progress point to reach, and it's, it's, a, it's, a easy, uh, it's easy to establish that, that, that the demo has happened and it's a, that we can get a quick payment halfway through the project and then a final payment at the end and have that spelled out really clearly is really important. Um, improve your contract if errors arise. So if you ever get to a point where you, you realize that you worded something differently. You worded something in a way where it created some confusion in the contract. Kind of try to try to to point out where this happened and try to fix your contract each time. And I, I change my contract almost every project and find better ways of of kind of protecting myself and the wording and protecting the client. And I think that's really important. And use change orders. Um, so if there's a deviation from the contract, it's really really important to have a change order. And that specifies what the amount of labor and, and material cost will be with the change order. Sometimes we'll be doing a project and the garden the, the client might say, Oh, I want to have an additional zone for the gray water, or I wanna I wanna water I wanna buy a couple more plants and or add some more outlets and and so it's really important to make sure before that happens you set a, um, set some guidelines and what the cost will be, what the labor is and have them sign that before that happens. And what I always give a client a blank change order form before we start so they can see what the change order form looks like. And that way it kind of sets sort of a precedent that, oh, okay, if I have to change something, this is the form I fill out. And that way they realize that, oh, I can't just keep adding things here and there and just expect it's not going to cost more. So I think it's really important to do that before the project starts. Um, calculating costs. Um, it's really important to mark up your material. Five to ten percent markup is is customary, um, but I have not. I've had times where we mark it up fifty percent or more, depending on if the part was hard to get, if it took long long time to ship, and different. You know, if it's just a difficult site or different difficult client, I think it's more than fair to mark up fifty percent. So, and I wouldn't feel bad about doing it. And sometimes you can even put it in your contract that that's what the markup is, and and justify to the client that. You know, it takes a lot of time and energy to do this, and that's sort of your profit margin. And if I, I tell clients, if they feel like that's too high to mark up, and I say, you know what, then feel free to purchase the materials. Here's the materials list, and once the materials are ordered in here, I can do the installation. Once you realize how hard it is to get the parts, how much of a pain it is, they usually have no problem paying you what your, what your fees are. Um, if you can get a seller's permit and buy wholesale parts when possible, you can definitely save money doing that, and you can buy in bulk and buy maybe parts for a few projects in a row, or maybe if you know another installer, you can you can put your, pull your money together and buy um, three valves. Uh, uh, a little while back, we bought 50 three valves at once, and I think we got them for about $20 a piece. That really saved us a lot of money. Um, and now when we sign, when we do a workshop or we do an event, I'll like raffle off a three valve, and that's a fun way to also do some creative marketing. And the clients pay for everything. Um, that is that is a really important thing to remember, um, and I and I, when I say that I mean you know make sure to charge them for delivery time, for hauling disposal charges, for your gas and labor, for your insurance. It's really important to factor those things into the bid. You can't just think of just the material and labor, but make sure you cover all of your overhead. And those are easy things to forget, and so I definitely incorporate that when you're calculating your costs. Change orders, I kind of already mentioned. I want to, we're getting it low on time. I want to make sure I get through everything. Um, if What I kind of mentioned before is more of a, a, a doing a fixed bid. There's also estimates and doing a time and material job. So an estimate, basically, you're giving the client a range, and you're saying, once the project is done, I'll bill you at the end what the, what the, what the fee will be. Versus a, a bid, which once you submit a bid and both cl both the client and contractor sign it, you cannot ask for more money at that point unless there's a change order, and that's by California law. Whereas an estimate, you can ask for money and you can leave an open-ended um, cost. And a time and material job basically just says, 
um, whatever the actual time spent on the site and material purchased by the contractor will be what you charge the clients. So that's important because you have to really keep good good um, track of all those things and receipts. So if you're doing a time material job and you're not doing a good job of saving receipts and you lose a few dollars of, of receipts and materials, that could be a problem. And time material jobs, clients are a lot more likely to hover over you and watch all of your labor. And so you might put, oh, I left at five, but they might say, oh, but you left at four forty-five, and I don't want to charge, I don't want to pay for that extra fifteen minutes, so things like that. So, so I think kind of depending on what the, I, I usually use a time material job uh, format for really difficult jobs, right? It's hard. There might be a lot of unknowns, or a lot of things are hard to predict. I'll use a time material job. But some clients don't always like it. It's very open-ended. And they don't know what they're going to be paying. Whereas a bid, they know exactly what the what it'll cost. But if there's a lot of unknowns and it takes you more time, you could lose some money on that. So those are the kind of the risks and sort of things you have to estimate and kind of and understand before you start a project. Um, so how Greywater has benefited my business, this is this is the back of our office. I get a little Bernie Sanders plug in there. But this is our, our billboard that faces a freeway, and we use that as also another creative marketing tool. Um, and I think the way Greywater has benefited my business is it is – it kind of is a way to demo. It's one. It's it's another revenue stream. Um, it shows that you that we are kind of dedicated to finding creative solutions to doing water saving. Um, and also, what I like about gray water is it every project is a little bit different, so it kind of breaks up the monotony of doing sort of the same thing every time. Um, one thing I think is also benefited is I I started my business in sort of a time of of a recession. And using gray water was a great way to show some of the economic benefits of, of doing sustainable and ecological gardening. And so I feel like it almost, my business model almost worked well and in, in starting it in that time versus other people who don't have that same approach. You really can't focus on the economic and ecological benefits of, of, of a traditional way of gardening, whereas gray water you can. So that really helped us kind of, kind of starting my business at that time. And I just think it's it's a really rewarding way to approach garden design, and um, it sets us apart. It, it shows that you really believe in in doing the right thing, and so I'm really glad that we've put gray water such an emphasis in our projects. Um, so the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I was gonna um, I've kind of talked about a few bad experience, or a few good experiences, but definitely a bad experience that that I've had, um, which definitely. Um, was a a good learning curve, and so in doing the contracts, I feel like the most the, the all the struggles that I the biggest problems I've had, I feel like have been in in writing contracts um, and in disputes between what was what was expected and what was owed, and and usually in, in most in most instances um, when things like that happen, I think it, it's it can it's I really try to avoid getting contentious arguments with clients. So nine times out of ten, if there's disagreement, I usually end up just kind of biting the bullet and and just doing the work. If I, you know, if I may not necessarily getting paid for it, but those can those aren't always those are just avoidable situations. So that's why I, I really feel like that the, writing the contract is is a really key part of of doing the system. And I feel like that's been the, the hang up. The, any those have been the biggest hang ups. I feel like if you are honest and you work hard and, and follow through that most systems are going to work out. Um, I feel like the, 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 the only time I've had a, a bad system, and I feel like when there's been a time where we're trying to kind of do it on the cheap or the client is trying to maybe do some parts on their own or there isn't a really clear plan. So I feel like having a clear plan, a clear design, a clear contract usually really results in a, a much better project. Um, so some some quick tips that I that I would recommend in terms of helping with some of the profitability on the projects that's worked out really well for us is using salvage material whenever possible. Um, we use a lot of arbor mulch for our projects for doing mulch basins or or doing uh, lawn removals. Um, we try to get creative in in reusing existing irrigation or plumbing parts that are on site whenever we can. Um, Using uh, creating your own compost, using compost on site, um, getting um, getting cardboard from local sources um, can also save on money. Um, collaborating with others 
um, working with other installers you can do kind of different work exchanges that we've done in the past I've done that with other contractors where they'll help me out on a project and I'll help them out on a project um, if you do do that make sure it's really clear and there's a good understanding of what's expected um, thinking big picture and so one thing too sometimes with with a, a, a client they'll they'll will we'll be in the middle of installation and you know I definitely say perceive a caution of this a little bit but Sometimes they'll they'll say, hey, I want I want a, a very small change, and if you I feel like if you do the bid right, you can still accommodate small changes without having to do a, a change order, and I feel like that kind of keeps the client happy. I feel like I, if if it's it, I'd rather avoid an argument over a few dollars and keep the client happy and get a referral than than try and nickel and dime the client for every last little penny. I think it kind of leaves a bad taste in their mouth and not, doesn't want that. It, it'll it'll stop them from wanting to do business with you in the future or referring. So I really try to think of the big picture and just kind of keep them happy. And I feel like, that you know, not fighting over every last penny will end up making you more money in the, in the long run. So I think, you know, think of the big picture when it comes down to some of those, some of the issues. And being honest, work hard, and be thorough. And really, um, I feel like it can really help you be more profitable and be more successful. Um, so that is it, and I really thank everyone for listening. Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, so if people have any questions, feel free to, to type them in. We have um, almost 15 minutes to do questions. Um, so, Alan, I have one question about people who are maybe – maybe they are a licensed contractor, maybe they aren't, but they're from the, the landscaping side of things, and they are mm -hmm. looking for a quality plumber, someone who either understands gray water or can be – um, can quickly learn how to do the plumbing portion. And I was wondering if you have any tips, because I know you work in several different cities in the South in San Jose mm -hmm. area. Yeah, for the most part, um, I have one contract or one plumber that I've worked with for several years, and he does all of my all of my plumbing for the under the house, usually the ABS stuff. Um, I, you know what? I wish I had more more tips on that than than, than I going to give you um i would say reaching out to local unions and um I, in my opinion and i what I, I found most most plumbers are really excited about gray water but don't necessarily know all the fine details about the irrigation side of it so sometimes they they can be really insightful in terms of doing the plumbing um so i think i feel like most licensed plumbers are, i i feel like Almost if they're if they're open-minded to doing gray water, I think almost any one of them will do a good job. I feel like they just need a little bit of coaching on on the irrigation side. But I, I found most plumbers to be really fantastic to work with because most of them usually have a very professional attitude and have a, a large knowledge base to to kind of to to tap into. Sorry, I wish I had more tips, but I I feel like just kind of um just reaching out to local plumbers and the local union is a great way to do it or just other contractors i feel like all contractors know kind of plumbers and electricians so if you know general contractors or just talk to other tradesmen if you don't know a plumber offhand and then could you talk a little bit about how you um, transition between like you started out with just more simple gray water systems and now you're doing much more complex systems can you talk a little bit about how that transition was for your company yeah um, so I guess in the beginning, I didn't do too many complex systems, just m m um, more, I, I was kind of scared of the permitting process and just, I wanted to learn sort of the, the basics of just doing a launch landscape system at first. Um, so I mean, the, the way I trained the way I, after getting my, um, going through Laura's, um, class, I did a lot of systems for my my friends and my family, and and uh, kind of just did volunteer systems that way. I, or volunteer to install systems, and that helped me get a lot of experience. So that when I did do more complex systems, um, I just I had um, a lot more just hands-on experience of doing it myself. I think um, doing complex systems. I guess I got more into doing complex systems for for whole house um, projects. I I. I I felt like a lot of the systems, a lot of times just doing a branch drain didn't always work for a lot of our projects. So, and then getting the permit for a branch drain was almost just as difficult as getting one for a more advanced system. So mm -hmm. really, and, and I feel like a lot of clients, no matter, they would always want to do some sort of a drip system or some want to work with their existing 
irrigation system. And I, I feel like doing the some of the pumped and filtered systems allowed a lot more flexibility and people like the idea of being able to reach more plants. And so I've, I guess it was just like a, a sort of a natural progression to, to just doing more, more complex systems. And I, in one way I, I tell people too, is if we're doing a whole, a new irrigation system, which is just a conventional irrigation that, that could even cost up to four or $5,000 anyways. And that could, that could, you could install a pump gray water system for that same cost. So I really kind of use a way to kind of compare prices and show that you can you can still get a kind of a higher end gray water system for a similar cost of just installing a traditional drip line. And I feel like having the more products I do, the more I can kind of show people how this kind of pencils out and makes sense. And it just lends itself to doing more of those types of systems. Can you... So the next question is, how much time and resources do you need to commit to manage and administrate, administer employees? Oh, my God. <laughs> a lot. I mean, I, I would say I'm probably doing I, – I, I'm at the point where I almost don't even do any of the installations anymore at all, where I'm all I really do is just do permitting, writing the bids, doing the design, and just – dealing with client questions and concerns over the phone and emails and then, you know, making um, um, site visits periodically. But I'm, I say almost all my time is spent doing that. It's just managing the project. I, I, I usually very rarely, if almost never do the installations anymore, which is kind of a bummer because that's the part I really like. And so I'm, I'm really just doing everything else but the fun stuff at this point. And I feel like, and, and that's not, and that, that really will depend on how, how large, of a company people um, develop. If it's just you and another person, I feel like you could easily spend maybe just an hour or two a night during during an installation of a project, maybe, you know, half an hour or so of taking some notes and some emails and a phone call, and maybe, you know, half an hour to an hour just to plan for the next day. So I feel like if, if you're a smaller outlet, you know, not that much, maybe just an hour or two. But and if you you're said the, you have the bigger, 10 employees? I have 10, 10, 10 people just doing installations. And that's not just gray water. That would just be doing rain catchment system, doing lawn conversions, doing, you know, just general um, ecological kind of landscape design. Um, so, but we're doing about one, about one launched landscape project a week, and we're doing about one pumped system a month. And so that's about, that's the, about the capacity that we can handle right now. Um, this is a very specific question. What kind of sod cutter do you do you use? Have you tried a manual oh, yeah. kick style? Um, I, I have I have tried those. They they do work. They're they're just going to be a little bit more labor intensive. Um, you know, I I I, I do know that some people will probably be a little apprehensive about using using you know a, a gas power tool. Um, I try. I about one of the only gas powered tools I use is a sod cutter. I think they they just save so much time. It, it I, I I think it's it, it it's it's worth it, especially with larger projects, and it, it makes it really easy to remove the grass. And you, we, we, what we do is we take all that grass, and we actually compost it right here at our office, compost the grass, and then we use that same compost for for other projects down the road. So I kind of I feel like us composting on site helps offset the gas that we're using for the sod cutter. The the brand that we use is called is a Billy Goat, and it's the their 18 inch model. And I like this model because it has a has a hydraulic assist and it has like a dampening on the handle, so it doesn't make it so jarring to um, to use as some of the older units. And it, I, and if, if people if people don't want to purchase one. You can rent them for 150 bucks a day and, and tow it behind your truck. I, I, I and it, if, especially if you're a smaller crew with just one or two people, I mean, having one of those sod cutters can replace two or three guys easily. And if you rent it, you, there's there's not a lot of um, capital investment in terms of buying it yourself. Um, can you talk a little bit about finding enthusiastic clients? This is in the context that. There really isn't an ROI on those systems, gray water systems, as well as you know any landscape um, work for the most part. So, can you talk a little more how you're finding enthusiastic clients? 
I, 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 I find that my best clients do my classes because I feel like if they're if if client is willing to spend time on like a weeknight, you know, to come to a, you know like a library to hear me talk from six to eight o'clock at night, you know, they must be really excited about this. And so getting to talk to those people, so they're already engaged, they already want to learn and hear about this. So I feel like if you can if you can you know do a really good job of of making gray water seem fun and easy and um, show why it makes sense. I, it, it, the, the clients, I feel like they're almost like sold on at that point and you just kind of have to kind of just encourage them to reach out to you. And so I think that's why I, I try to make my talks kind of fun, engaging, let them ask questions. I try and do a lot of hands-on stuff. Sometimes if I do a talk, we'll do a little hand, we'll go outside in like a parking lot somewhere and we'll do a little mold space in or just do something kind of fun, a little like raffle something off, you know, I just like to I like to have them leave the talk just really excited and just and, and stoked about do it gray water and I usually get I I think almost every time I do a talk I get at least one client out of it and so that's why I, I think doing talks and workshops are, are a really great way to reach out to clients and sometimes I'm even getting paid for it so instead of paying for advertising I'm actually getting paid to advertise my company you're learning about during the talk itself you're kind of you're learning about just kind of um, reiterating some of the facts and information and you kind of you, you're just helping yourself learn more about it you're teaching the clients and I, think, I just think it's a it's such an invaluable way to reach out to, to people um, and a question about sourcing materials can you I know you mentioned earlier maybe I'm not sure if you mentioned it to me before we started the webinar but there's a website that you, you use to get a lot of the gray water systems and specialty parts yeah, yeah, it's it, and well, actually, one last thing I was going to say about about just getting clients is is that's the only I have no other advertising. The only way I really advertise is my workshop. So I think that shows that that's a it, it's a way that works to get clients. Um, so last thing, and so what what the where I get the parts is through it's called Gray Hub Irrigation, and they're down in I think Santa Barbara, and they they sell uh, gray water parts, um, rain catchment parts. Um, pumps, different valves, three-way valves. They're they're really and they're they're really good customer support too. That's so why I really like Greyhub too. We also get parts from Urban Farmer as well too. They're really good. And and Ewing has 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 a uh, rank catchment. And sometimes I I I've heard someone say some Ewing stores are carrying three-way valves. I don't know if that's true or not. But and in terms of getting reused material. I, I usually I usually get my molds from Tree Arborist, and so I'll usually just do like a a search online to get a list of different Tree Arborists, and then just kind of go down the list and just contact each one of them and find out if they're if they're doing a tree removal in in an area near where my project is, um, and I try to ask for a removal versus just a tree trimming because if it's a removal you'll get a lot more woody material versus getting a lot of leafy material. Um, and it's important to know that you're going to get a full truckload, so it's usually going to be around 10 yards. So have a plan to be able to use all of it, maybe in a different part of the yard or share it with a neighbor. Um, but I think we're pretty much at the end of the time. Um, and I don't actually, Ellen, I didn't see your website anywhere, that I don't believe. Could you tell people your website so if they want to go and um, see, get more yeah. information or contact you? Yeah, sorry. I, I, um, it's um, it's Bay Maples. And that's B A Y M A P L E S dot com. And if anyone's interested, I have no problem sharing um, this presentation. I also can share like my my uh, contract template forms. So if anyone wants to see sort of what my contract looks like, I could. I have no problem sending that to anybody. Um, or I have some other links and resources I could share with people. Great. And you could anyone on the webinar can just send it to me if you don't find, or you could find them through the website. Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much yeah, for that totally. offer. That's great. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Uh, um, so we're going to end, and thank you so much, Alan. That was really informative, and thanks everyone thank for you. joining us. Great, and see you next time. I appreciate. It. Have a good one, Laura. Talk to you soon. Bye.